Hello again, this is a second video clip to discuss some of the topics from Reading Guide on Chapter 3 of McClendon. I want to turn now to what he describes as our basic moral equipment. McClendon in this chapter has been trying to uh, find an approach to talking about what some at times have called personal ethics uh, to uh, looking at uh, concepts related to our bodily existence, our personhood, and that personhood that each of us has and our distinctiveness and how it is that we live a moral life within the bodies that God has given us. And so we'll talk about some of the topics from the reading guide in class, but just to help us get a little more ready. Let me uh, hit a few of the uh, concepts here that uh, I've asked you to try to understand. One is uh, on question five, it asks you about drives and instincts. Um, let's talk specifically about instincts. If you were trained as I was uh, in, in your education, you may have been given the perspective that human beings operate primarily out of choice and other species operate more by instinct and in that sense almost as if they're programmed and have to operate in a certain way in a kind of stimulus response instinctual way. Um, and so this difference was greatly exaggerated during the time of my uh, previous education. Uh, more and more what we find as uh, scientists have sought to better understand human beings in relation to other species is that we have found um, that while there may be certain powers and capacities that human beings have in uh, a greater uh, extent than than other uh, species uh, were not in all ways uh, um, so completely different that there are um, instinctual patterns in human behavior uh, if you certainly people talk about a mothering instinct a parenting instinct even uh, they talk about our instincts to uh, fight or flight uh, based on the apprehension of danger. The more we study about human animals, the more we come to see that, for instance, there seems to be a kind of sign language that can be communicated between a parent and an infant long before the parent is able to um, converse with words with their child um, and so perhaps some instinctually imp imprinted um, patterns uh, that that infants come into the world with the ability to understand perhaps moreover we find that there are certain facial expressions on infants which can be classified and if we know how to read those facial expressions, we will understand the, the inner emotional state, um, emotional cognitive state of the infant. Uh, these would be things that they didn't learn but came into the world with. We also notice, and this is a topic to discuss uh, later when we get to a unit on human sexuality, but we also notice that there are certain kind of patterns among um, adult humans uh, which seem to show some kind of uh, instinctual imprinting um, perhaps something that became part of uh, the human species over uh, long millennia or perhaps uh, something that's sort of built into our genetic makeup in some way but for instance the attractiveness between um, uh, person seems to be highly uh, uh, correlated to 
a kind of bilateral symmetry of the face. And so when human beings are tested on uh, who they who in pictures that they find most attractive, uh, a very strong correlation to those who have uh, the most exact bilateral facial symmetry. And these are things that we didn't, somebody didn't teach us to say, okay, make sure the eyes are exactly the same and each side of the nose is exactly the same. You know, we didn't learn it that way. Uh, it's somehow printed in us. Th these would be just small examples of the existence of instinctive behavior uh, in human beings. Um, similarly, we find what was not understood long ago, uh, not that long ago, which is that uh, birds have to be taught the songs to sing, that they sing in order to be able to communicate among their, uh, the birds among whom they live. Uh, similarly, um, uh, even carnivorous hunting animals like cats have to be taught how to hunt. And uh, without that teaching, they may have some instinctual uh, impulse to go after the little string that you wave or a mouse that runs across the floor. But once they get it, they don't know what to do with it. And... Uh, and so we have house cats that will run up to a mouse and then kind of play with it and then walk away. Um, so there is a kind of learning that is quite extensive in other species as well. And that uh, learning as well as choosing uh, to act in certain ways is part of their existence. There are many other ways in which our species are similar often. People have tried to argue that well, what makes human beings distinct is our capacity for language, and yet we find among many of the uh, families of species of uh, animals um, very highly developed capacity for speech, even if it doesn't match to the same extent of a human being. Um, the large sea mammals such as dolphins and whales, have extensive vocabulary and ability to communicate, often even to communicate across species. Uh, similarly, among uh, the great apes, um, particularly gorillas, uh, highly developed language capacity. Um, among the birds, the uh, macaws uh, have hundreds of different um, language signs that they're able to to use to communicate and so we could go we could go on and on but the point being uh, highly developed communication abilities in other species um, shows that what is instinct uh, and what is is learning is something that's been given and what is choosing is something that's been given to all of creation but with different powers and different extents. Um, and so we do have uh, instinct. Now, the complication, of course, is that we also are highly cultured in the sense that we, we always learn in a, in a culture and in a context. There is no human, human existence that's not a cultural existence. And so in that sense, it's natural for us to be cultural. So culture is part of our nature, although culture then can have vast uh, variation within it. And so culture and nature are always intertwined, and this again brings us back to the issue of how difficult it is to speak about nature in trying to determine how we ought to live, uh, what, what are the specific judgments of ethics. Even so, McClendon doesn't want us to leave behind uh, the body then and simply try to go to a realm of pure reason. And so he looks then in the rest of this chapter for different doors, different windows perhaps into how we might learn from our bodily existence about what the life of uh, 
of the Christian ought to be. Uh, so he introduces, for instance, three terms together, needs and goods and rights. Now needs are a concept.